an introduction to the WinLink system. WinLink is a volunteer project of this group, uh, Amateur Radio Safety Foundation. Um, and so the, it's more than just this software application, um, you know, an application like Outlook, of course, it uses um, the internet and it uses um, servers all over the world. Um, with uh, with WinLink, you can actually, um, you know, get this or that piece of software. And uh, though there is a most popular one, I'll, I'll show you. Um, you, can, you can send emails, you can send files even as attachments, though uh, the, the size is, is limited due to the speed. Low, far lower than ethernet, right? Obviously, okay. So you can also connect, um, you can tech, connect via radio of various sorts, but also an internet connection, um, which is what I often do if I'm just in a hurry. Uh, just using a, what's called Telnet. So you can send or receive emails from just about anywhere. And Peter, I know, uh, VA6RPL is excited about this because a lot of blue water sailors use um, Winlink. Uh, and he's he's a sailor himself. Um, connections typically, or not typically, but they normally go to uh, from your computer, type out an email, then you start the, uh, the modem and it goes out over the air to a radio message server or gateway, um, which is, you know, owned by a ham somewhere, um, just volunteers. Uh, and from there, uh, the gateways connect typically over the internet to uh, one of their generally just, I think just two of these CMSs are common message servers. And uh, thanks to Amazon, they, they host those. So then a, a message can go from you up to a radio mail server um, over the radio, then internet to the common message server. And then when someone else logs on, someone you've emailed and they log on to WinLink um, to the system, the message can be very quickly sent down over the internet to a, a whatever RMS they've connected to, the radio message server, and then it gets sent back by radio to them. Okay. And uh, yeah, the messages are sent redundantly to all of the, the CMSs or common message servers. So, uh, you know, if one of them should by chance go down, um, you know, as long as one of them is connected to the internet, you're not going to lose your messages. Um, the software we typically use is called WinLink Express to access the WinLink system. There, there is a connection behind the scenes between the two, but there are others. Um, most people do use WinLink these days, it seems. Um, there are options for Mac and Linux as well. Um, I haven't tried them because I don't use those. Uh, you use uh, the person's, the, the recipient's email address as their uh, 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 email. Uh, what, I'm getting backwards. You use the, the recipient's call sign as their email address. All right. And that is just super simple. Um, you can, let me see, to email someone who's not using WinLink, you just use their regular email address. So for me, uh, my, my home address, jweeder at shaw.ca, no problem. Um, or if you're emailing someone who's using WinLink um, from a public service like Gmail or Ymail or, or just your Outlook, you know, going to shaw.ca or whatever, then you just send it to call sign like the E6EI at winlink.org. And it goes up to a CMS, the common message server, and it sits there until they log on uh, with WinLink and then they can pick it up. Okay. You register on the system just quite quickly by just getting the software and running it and, and a form pops up and uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. Okay, winlink.org, that's where you go get the software there. Um, okay, why use it? Well, it's becoming the standard for emergency and disaster relief communications. Um, you know, a lot of people use it um, because email is just so common. Everybody uses email, right? And so if, if, um, if somebody with a Red Cross or somebody with a local fire department wants to contact or send a, a uh, list. They say the Red Cross wants to send a list of everybody who's who's um, been registered at a certain shelter. Uh, it's so much easier to just type it all out and then and then send it in a quick email as opposed to um, 
uh, as a voice, um, uh, uh, you know, on a net or something. That's still the way a lot of people seem to want to do it, but it's much, much slower. Okay. You can operate completely without the internet. Suppose, you know, um, as they say, the, the poop hits the fan, as they say, and, and um, the internet goes down. There's actually um, these hybrid gateways where the, the ham involved sets it up just a little differently. And now if an email hits them from somebody's radio um, and the internet's down, they can automatically forward it to other RMSs who are also hybrid and eventually it gets to the correct destination um, RMS and then it can be downloaded. So that's if the internet goes down, pretty rare, but it, it is possible. And you can connect from just about, you know, not almost anywhere, any, anywhere on the planet. Absolutely. As long as, you know, you've got HF or VHF, UHF connectivity. There are these things called templates, which I, I can show you in a little while, um, to create common email forms. Um, you know, the Red Cross has one and different agencies have their own. Um, and the, the most common that I've seen is ICS, Incident Command, whatever, 213. This is used by Aries Auxiliary Community. The Auxiliary Comm Service is basically what Aries is morphing into, I guess, Red Cross and others. And CFARS, um, I have been a member of CFARS, um, though just due to time commitments, I am not right now but they use it a lot. They've got other more sophisticated software that's secure and what have you, but um, they use WinLink a lot because it's, it's easy and it's, um, it's, it's, again, it's a common system. Okay. And of course you can use it. If you're ham, you can use it for non-emergency use. It's not like you're, you know, um, you're limited uh, to disasters. Um, there's several, channel options available in the software. And I'll show you in the actual software before we're done here. Telnet, you see the little list in the lower right that pops up in the software. Telnet is an internet connection. Packet, the next one down. That's what we actually have here in Calgary. Hard to believe, but yep, Packet is making a comeback. Um, currently it's a 1200 baud modem um, and the, the our our friends with FARS, um, Dan St. Pierre, who you might have seen his name in the, the heading of this, this presentation, he helped me build it. Um, he's set up and with others with, uh, in the FARS group, uh, they've got a, a gateway set up up at the CTV tower um, on 431 megahertz, 431 megahertz. And it's got good coverage from up there. Um, there's another one that he's experimenting with at his home in Okotoks. Uh, and you need to get to that one through a through a digipeter, and there's a digipeter at Alderside. So there you go. Anyway, another mode is packed or so 1200 baud. That's not bad. That's better than you're <clears throat> typically going to get on HF. But one of these days, we'll maybe we'll go to 9600 baud modems. Pactor, uh, boy, Pactor is a proprietary modem type hardware box. I used to have one, and they're uber expensive. Well, you know as much as a radio, really, like well over $1,000 unless you get an old one. Um, and they're relatively fast for HF and good error correction and so on. Um, but even CFARS is kind of drifting away from them due to the, the cost versus Pactor, or sorry, versus um, Winlink. And um, uh, what I'll show you, it's called the Vera HF modem. There's a free version of that. Um, though there's there's a uh, paid version, not very expensive that, that's faster. Okay, so there it is, Vera HF. Um, okay, and Vera FM. That actually is a software modem. Both of these Vera um, software packages, they're they're software modems. They create tones, and of course they they uh, decode tones for receive as well. Um, and so you connect to your radio either using like a signal link or something, or in my, the case of my two radios that I've got here, just over USB, kind of handy. There's also a whole group down at the bottom of that list called peer-to-peer -peer sessions. Um, you can connect directly to another ham who's also running peer-to-peer -peer mode, right? As long as you know, you know, they're gonna be on this certain frequency at a certain time, okay? Um, you can download information to choose the best gateway. 
here you can see a sample of that. Um, you can update, there's a, I wonder if I can point at it, update via internet right there. You hit that button and it updates very quickly um, to get the latest kind of propagation related information. You can update via radio, um, you know, and have to send out, it creates an email automatically, you send it out and you connect again five, 10 minutes later and it gives you a, um, it updates the table. Uh, so this this is based on conditions and where the gateways are. Uh, path quality estimates are not always perfect, I'll tell you that. Just today I was testing and I found some of the ones that I usually connect to and it says the reliability is 67%, but couldn't connect at all. You just, you know, the local conditions. Okay, so on HF, sometimes you have to try several different gateways and not just all in Canada, you know, I connected gateways in the US all over the place, even connected to one in Mexico. And that software, it's, it's smart. Um, the, the software modem will typically try, you know, because of poor HF conditions, it, it'll keep trying up to 10 times. Um, and it's not just due to conditions. Another reason is um, a lot of these HF gateways will be scanning two or three or even four frequencies. So they'll sit on one frequency for about three seconds, then they go to a different band, different band, different band. So it could take up to about 12 seconds to scan through all of the bands. So you have to keep trying repeatedly and eventually connect. Okay, so here's what I've got um, for my HF setup. And this is very common. There's a laptop or a desktop computer, uh, USB cable going direct to the HF rig. Um, I have right here TS590, um, really, really straightforward to get set up. It's, it's just so cool, um, very easy. And then right on out to an antenna. So that is a super simple setup. I also have an ICOM uh, 7200 in my Go box. I'll show you a couple of pictures of the Go box uh, before we're done here. Okay. Uh, the alternate way of doing it um, with a rig that doesn't have a built-in sound card by a USB is you use either a signal link or what's the other one called a rig blaster. You know, there's probably probably others, um, some like kind of homebrew things. And so they can help with rig control and then they, they, they've got the modem built in. So you connect to the radio through that, right? I'm showing an ICOM 706 there because that's still a popular radio even though they haven't made it in years. It's just so compact. By the way, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself at any time uh, and and ask because I'm I'm blasting through here pretty quickly, All right? Okay, here's um, a VHF or UHF Winlink station. It's not that different. Okay, I, I haven't seen many VHF or UHF rigs with a built-in USB sound card capability. Maybe the ICOM 9700, expensive radio though, right? So most people would use like a, the old Cantronics KPC3 um, TNC or anybody else's TNC for that matter. You know, these guys still make that. It's hard to believe they still make it all these years later. Um, an alternative is to use a software modem and that's where a software package like Vera FM comes into play. So these same people, there's one guy in Europe somewhere, I forget exactly, who uh, has created Vera, both the, the HF modem and the VHF uh, FM modem. Okay, so then you just have your audio and, and control going from the rig. Um, actually, that would that would probably again go through a signal link. I didn't include that. Um, yeah, so there, there's also, by the way, if you wanna do packet, but you don't wanna buy this, this TNC that, hey, it could go obsolete tomorrow, who knows? Um, there, there's actually a, um, a couple of software um, packet modem um, software applications. One is called, I think, Dire Wolf. I forget what the other is, but uh, there are a couple of software apps. Joel, I do have a question. Yes. Uh, Winlink Express is the application you need to be running. Yeah. Is that, is that on Windows only? Is there applications that allow you to use this on a Mac or you know a Linux system? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did mention that earlier, but I'm moving pretty fast. Um, I'm not aware of names, but I, I think if you were to go to winlink.org and poke around, you'd probably find 
um, which software, but I, I have heard that there are um, equivalent software packages uh, to WinLink Express uh, for both uh, Apple and Linux machines. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, don't forget, yeah, you can get good benefit from, from once you've got your digital setup going, um, you know, you can do other stuff. You can run FT8, you can run, you know, F, any any mode, uh, software mode that um, um, that you like. Um, so it's a, it's a real benefit if you haven't got on digital yet. But if you have gotten on digital modes and you're running FT8, you know, or, um, or JS8 call or whatever, um, you can much more easily then set up WinLink because you're going to use the same um, either USB port on your, your radio to computer or the same signal link or, or rig blaster. Um, so, you know, you just get the software. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, FT8, for example, is super popular right now, but we're not really here to talk about that. So um, also APRS, of course. So that capability is actually built into a lot of radios. Hey, cool. Um, Whisper. Anyway, PSK31. That's when I was thinking of some people are still using PSK for sure. Okay. <laughs> or radio teletype. Yeah. Woof. Okay. Um, here's a quick slide about the infrastructure locally. As I mentioned, FARS has uh, um, put together a couple of um, gateways or radio message servers. FAR-10 is up at uh, as I said, at the uh, CTV tower. So it's got a tremendous view of the, of the area. Um, and, but there is also a, a, a digipeter, which is, there's an image of it there. It's just a, a TNC and a radio power supply. And the, uh, the cavities up above, those big cans, I'm not sure, I never quite got the right answer out of Dan, um, but probably they're sharing that facility with some other um, repeaters, so they, they had to have some filtering. Um, notice it says FAR-11 may become active again. <clears throat> that one was at the High River Hospital, um, and uh, I believe it was at the hospital anyway, and it was going for, for quite some time, but then they had some troubles and had to, had to remove it. Um, so that's why the digipeter was there to provide connection into, uh, to, from T High River to Calgary. Um, but it's now being used. Anybody wants to connect down to Dan's place. He lives downtown in Okotoks, and there's quite a drop, a ridge downwards. So you can't hit it direct from most of Calgary. So you go through the digipeter. Slows it down a little bit. It works. Okay. <laughs> There's me in my favorite Hawaiian shirt. A typical uh, field deployment. Okay, you can see this is my brother's uh, ICOM 7300. Wow, what a sweet radio. Okay, just a, a love, lovely little radio, very lightweight and very low power consumption uh, on receive. It draws just under one amp. That's the lowest of any modern radio I know of. And uh, that's super beneficial when you can see I'm running on battery here. My cursor keeps going away. There it is. That's, that's the battery. And that goes to a little power distribution box to power the, the tuner and the VHF rig, UHF rig, and the TNC. Um, over here is, is a handheld, dual band handheld. I was using that for, um, uh, for my um, packet radio. Um, I rigged up a little cable to connect it to the, uh, um, to the uh, computer and that worked, it worked fine. Um, yeah, anyway, that was before I got my Go Box put together. Here's, uh, <laughs> this is at a park uh, towards the west end of Fish Creek Park. So there's a 16-foot painter's pole uh, propped up against the, uh, the table there with a VHF, UHF dual band uh, vertical. Uh, that's a Diamond X50, great antenna, um, just small enough to break down and put into a car. And further away, it's further than it looks, there's a, a push-up mast over there, um, probably 50 feet away, and it's probably up 30 feet. It doesn't look like it, but it's some distance away. And I use a 40-meter inverted V. Um, uh, that actually with that IT100, awesome little ICOM tuner, um, it'll tune up on every band 80 on up. Um, 
you know, for a 40 meter inverted V. And I've, I've found <clears throat> a lot of people are buying these um, end fed half wave antennas. I burned one up. I bought this one that it's out in the yard right now. Um, and it was rated 250 watts. You know, I was like, are you kidding? So, okay, I figured I'll run it at 100 watts and I'll be safe. No, nope. <laughs> no, nope. burned it up using WinLink. If it was using voice or CW, it might've been okay. So do be careful. Digital modes like uh, uh, WinLink can um, uh, pretty, pretty high duty cycle. So you can heat up an antenna like that if the SWR is really high and its little transformer is working its tail off. Anyway, so my little ICOM tuner does the, the work here and it, it doesn't, doesn't complain at all. Okay, there's a photo of my Go box. This is um, uh, made by a company called uh, MCM, like Mike, Charlie, Mike, custom audio. And these racks um, are used for, it's, it's got a front cover and a back cover and you can clamp those on. And then you might have some high-end uh, audio gear in there, some, you know, an amplifier and some, you know, um, um, filters and this and that, you know, for a touring musician um, or whatever, you know, and they can carry it around in relative safety. But I found at a company in Ontario called Newark, um, they have a website, newark.ca, I think. Um, they were selling this rack with, um, and I bought two shelves to go with it. Um, man, and it was, they have free shipping over 200 bucks. It was ridiculous. This thing shows up and there's like this massive, you know, with, with all the shipping boxes, free shipping though. Anyway, so that's where the way I went. And inside there, here's my ICOM 7200. Uh, beside that is an IT100 tuner. Um, not much else in the bottom. Uh, top shelf is my uh, VHF UHF dual bander and FT7800. What a rock. That's a great little radio. Too bad they don't make it anymore. <clears throat> um, very simple radio compared to the 7900 and then the 8000 series. That's why I got rid of my... I forget what it was, 7,900. I didn't like it. Too many buttons. Um, and now all the modern ones are just crazy complicated. Um, in behind that radio, you can see sticking up the power cables, there's a Rig Runner 4006U. Um, just the right size for all the accessories here. And it has two USB uh, charging um, ports as well. So, you know, guaranteed you're out in the field and your phone's starting to die. You're going you're gonna to be happy to have that. Uh, over to the left, you can see an MFJ uh, little power supply that can handle 25 amps, so it can handle both radios at the same time. Above that is the TNC. Okay, so it's, some people will design a really complex go box. Um, this one, I went with simple, um, just drilled some holes in the shells and I tie wrapped everything down, um, you know, so I can move them uh, around later if I wanted to. And so far, I've moved this thing multiple times. And it, Big, thick tie, tire straps, not, not wimpy ones. And it hasn't had a problem at all. Okay. So that's that's the go box. Um, just clamped to the left side is a, there's a, a lamp there, you know, but it runs on AC. So I've got a little portable flashlight. And in the front and back covers, I put the antenna and uh, coax and a little, a little voltmeter for, you know, multimeter for doing some tests, some basic tools. Um, other things like that. And the microphones go in those uh, pouches in the front and back cover. So there you go. It's pretty much self-contained. Um, you can't see it, but uh, well, you can sort of see it. There's my 20 amp hour lithium battery um, sitting on top and that'll run this station for a few hours. Um, if I were going to be deployed for a long time, obviously I, first thing I do is I look for an AC outlet. Um, if they got power, run, run it on, run it on the AC. But um, you know, if you can just, uh, you know, if you know you're going to be gone for a long time, I've got under the desk here a 100 amp hour battery as well. Um, 60 pounds, though, I don't want to take it if I don't have to. But uh, that'll power the station for quite some time. Okay. What else? Okay, um, there's some slides here showing uh, that Dan provided showing how to get into everything. But you know what, I, I want to... Um, uh, quit this and actually just get into the um, the software itself. Okay, you're getting a super fast version here. And it, by the way, um, I, maybe I'll I'll just say there is a 
training manual uh, for WinLink. If you want to get into it, um, I was part of a team that created this this training manual. Um, I was the, the editor, and um, you know we worked on it for months last year, um, and then put quite a bit more work into modifying it here and there. If anyone wants a copy of this training manual, just let me know, and I can I can email a copy to you. There's actually a basic one that gets you up to the point of you know doing all this via just the internet, and then this one covers getting into doing everything via radio. Okay, all right. Um, so here's the main WinLink uh, screen that comes up, and when you first get it, um, it works. It works fine, but it's um, uh, oh, no. I'm thinking of Vera. When you when you get the Vera modem software. It's somewhat limited. It's free, but it's somewhat limited in speed. Like, you know, I forget what the speed is, but it, it works. Um, but if you pay, yeah, I think it's 80 or $90 or something, then you get the, the full version and it's, it's much faster. So this right now looks kind of like just any email application. You've got an inbox, notebox, sent items, saved items, deleted items, and so on. Um, I've got a contacts list down here. And here's emails that have just come in and that I've hung on to. I could probably delete most of them. And there's a settings menu. We could go through this for, for quite some time, but if you get really interested enough to actually try to set it up, let me know and I can I can send you the, the manual. Uh, oh, I've got a session running. That's why that complained at me. Let's just minimize this. Let's just close the session there. Okay, so now I can go into settings, go WinLink setup, and here you put in your call sign, you create a password, uh, you can put your contact info optionally, um, and there are these things called service codes. Uh, public is the most common, MCOM, yeah, if you're into if you're into emergency communications, and then our CFARS people. We when I was with CFARS, we had a different one. You can also create what are called auxiliary call signs. Like, you know, if you're deployed for a, a road rally, for example, you know, you, you don't necessarily use your call sign. You may say, I'm at, you know, mile post three, whatever. That could be your auxiliary call sign. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. All right. So that's your basic setup. Uh, there are other settings, again, uh, preferences, for example. Um, you can request message re receipts or you can automatically send message receipts but we disable all those you know we try to keep things as as minimalistic as possible we could talk more about that later just the idea being winlink typically is running over radio and it's slow so you don't send a 100 kilobyte attachment um, you don't ramble on in an email and you don't request message receipts if you don't need absolutely to do so uh, some people just think, oh my God, of course you need a receipt. No, if it's if it's uh, sent, you just the system is reliable. You just presume it's going to get through. Um, if you need a confirmation, the other person can send an email back. That's kind of the discussion we've had in the in the business. Um, and another thing related to all that: um, do not hit reply all or try to send an email about to 20 people, again, unless everybody needs it. Because this is, again, this is um, uh, overrating. Let's see, you can create an email, you hit this little button here, the white sheet of paper, pops up a new email, okay? And you could just say, send it to, and then you can post that to the outbox. Okay, I'll do that actually with that one. I can create another one here and I could just say, you know, that's that's uh, <laughs> Dan down in High River, and because I'm not including the the at, you know, wherever, uh, WinLink will assume that's going to stay on the WinLink system, and it'll just sit there. There you go. Okay, but uh, what I wanted to actually, I'm getting carried away. What I wanted to show you there is you can create templates, and there's a shortcut here to one. You can add shortcuts on the email. That's the most common one, so I put it there. But you can select a template, and there's tons of them um, for many organizations. But um, yeah, general, okay. You, know, you can just see there's there's too many of them to talk about right now. So I'll just click the ICS 213 
And oh, it's over on the other screen. Hopefully you can see that. It's actually um, a web browser, okay? But pre-populated with message number. I've sent quite a few of these messages. You can put a precedence, what kind of handling you wanna have, who is or, or who's the origin, <laughs> me, right? What's the time and date? You can put in name of an incident, uh, what operational period, all this stuff, right? Okay, and then put in the actual message contents, um, put in who's sending it and the date it was sent. Later, when the other person receives it, that can pop up as another um, web browser session and they can just populate some more boxes and hit submit and that creates the email, okay? So that's pretty handy. Um, some people love their forums um, and especially if you're working with a served agency, um, they're gonna want them. But if you're just doing it for personal use, um, or for, you know, for, because there's a flood in Calgary and it's happening on the fly. You don't, you know, you just do what you, what you know. You don't have to use the, the forms or templates. Okay, um, just being conscious of the time, I'm just gonna move on and show you um, a couple of quick sessions. First, here's that drop down list that I showed you earlier. You could do a Telnet session. Just click open session. So, that's creating a, a, a message using a form, right? Okay. You just build an email similar to using your Outlook or whatever you use, Gmail, okay? That's a, a form, okay? Uh, or or um, a template, as you call them, okay? After you hit submit, um, the email shows up in the outbox. And Here's just an example of, of a, uh, uh, an email that's been created okay. and it's sitting in the outbox right now. Okay. Once you hit the post to outbox button, it just goes away. And now you're gonna select a session. In this case, it's packet winlink. So there is a, the packet winlink um, session dialog that just for some reason would not show up um, here in Zoom. Um, and it's what you do is you say, I want to connect via Digipeter um, to VE6 FAR-10, in this case, uh, via VE6 HRA-8, FAR-10. Uh, I think I accidentally put 11. FAR-10 is the, uh, um, the gateway that was at the High River Hospital. And HRA-8 is the Digipeter at Alderside. Okay, so you, or you could, instead of Digipeter, you could select direct, and then you just say, let's connect via, in this case, it'd be a, a, a far, a, without being able to see the software, I kind of just suddenly blanked on which, uh, which um, is the current one. But uh, again, I can update you later on that. So this would be connecting to TNC. And in the you would set in the settings menu here before you but before you hit start you'd, you'd select which TNC you're using, um, baud rate all those good old fashioned things, uh, and then you hit the start button, and it just starts sending. It's the HF one that I find more interesting because it uh, it actually blasts out this these cool audio tones, and when the HF modem is going uh, and you've got the paid version, it can get going. At times, it's hard to believe, but in an audio channel of just 300 hertz to three kilohertz, you can have bursts on a clear channel of, of um, two to three kilobits per second. So it's actually faster than the 1200 baud uh, packet um, when conditions are really good. Um, that's not all that common. There are times where, and that's what I was hoping to show you here, um, you know, I could connect, there's a gateway in, um, let's just go to that screen, gateway uh, in the Arrow Lakes area of BC that normally I can hit quite well and it really zooms along. Um, there's several out on the BC coast. Uh, there's one in, um, I forget the exact area in Manitoba, Brandon area, I think. Um, the guys up in Edmonton have an HF gateway, though I can never hit the H, the, the, the Edmonton one for whatever reason. My antenna just works better north south, I guess. Um, many down in the US. Um, so HF 
um, you're going to use your HF rig, obviously, and, and a bigger antenna, but you reach further. And, and the point there being, if the disaster, you know, if, if this is a disaster scenario, uh, maybe the whole area you're in is, is affected. So the VHF or UHF local gateway doesn't work. Then you go to HF and you can reach out further. You may be going through a gateway in Mexico. God knows, as long as you can reach somebody. Okay, um, yeah, I'm, I'm about done here. So, uh, and we're about out of time. Uh, any uh, questions? Don't forget to unmute yourself or comments. I have a question, Joel. Sure, go ahead, Nira. First, thank you very much. It was a very clear and uh, uh, helpful uh, presentation. Um, I'm curious about the hybrid um, servers. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to know or is it just it just does its thing? There's no way um, for me to know? Yeah, there is a list in the software of um, you can uh, when when you go into the the, the, the sub menu where that list is, you can hit a button to update it. And so every RMS uh, sysop uh, operator who um, sets his system up as a hybrid um, will, you know, the, 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 the system discovers that. And, and uh, so then when you update the, the list, you'll get, you'll get the list of all the RMSs that are hybrid. And that again, just for everyone else, uh, that means that that gateway that you connect to via radio can itself connect, not just to the common message servers on the internet, but also do other hybrid gateways via radio you know, in case things really go all to hell. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay, Thanks. you're welcome. Anyone else? Joel, this is Warren here. I'm just wondering if there's ever been any real incidents that have tested the, the scalability of the Windlake uh, system and infrastructure in a, in a live uh, emergency situation. You know, I, uh, Warren, that's a good question. I haven't heard of, of too many directly. Um, and of the the outcomes, um, this is this is all. Windlink's been around for a while, but um, it's only starting in the last couple or three years to be used extensively by um, the the emergency services people. Um, yeah, I think it was used uh, for for those California fires here a year or two ago. Um, yeah, I don't really see a problem with it in terms of scalability because again. Um, there are many RMSs um, and uh, scattered around the globe and uh, around North America. Um, if now, if you had 30 people all in one city, uh, all trying to use a single RMS on VHF or UHF, and they were all really busy creating lots of emails, yeah, you could have a choke point there. But it's not that likely. Most likely, you know, each person might need to check in once an hour or something. And, you know, so you just wait till the, till the channel's clear. You turn up the volume and, oh, it's noisy. No, no, well, wait a minute. Okay, now it's clear. I'll, I'll go ahead and send my message. But, uh, I haven't heard of any specific issues with that anyway. But it, it is a good question. Um, I'd like to, to uh, look into that. The, uh, the training manual, I think, if, if you are interested, you know, this training manual has just tons of good information. It does kind of presume that you're um, using, well, for a, a radio with direct USB connectivity, it, it focuses on the ICOM 7300, which is the one that we've, we've done a lot of research and we figure it's kind of the, the best choice these days due to, it's, it's very common and it's very low power consumption for HF. Uh, and then, you know, we recommend a couple of VHF, UHF radios as well. But there's quite a bit in here about connecting via TNC, for example, um, or, or connecting via a signal link, that kind of thing, if you need to do that. So it's a pretty detailed uh, manual. It talks about tactical addresses and, oh, you can send a GPS position report even. Maybe not that useful, but, um, well, it could be for some people like... Um, you know, Dana and uh, and his uh, um, rallies, um, somebody might get to site and, uh, you know, chances are you're going to have VHF coverage anyway. But, but, you know, this is just one example. You could, you know, if it's a much bigger event, someone could get to some location and say, oh, there's a washed out bridge and they can uh, send a GPS position report over Windlink.
Okay, let's have a tour of the sessions in WinLink. First, as I mentioned earlier, there is a list of sessions available. We won't go into the peer-to-peer -peer sessions, but first a quick look at the Telnet session. Click Open Session and it appears. And you can see that it'll connect automatically every so often. Um, there are settings here, but basically the settings are pretty much um, bulletproof here. You can disable that automatic connect if you want. Okay. So you could just click start if you don't want to wait for the auto connect. And it goes, it bypasses uh, an RMS. It goes directly to the CMS or common message server okay, because we are hardwired here. There was nothing, so good enough. We'll just exit from that. Uh, obviously, if you've got uh, internet connectivity, why deal with the vagaries and delays of radio? Just use it. Just like if you've got AC power in an emergency situation, why mess with a generator or solar or something? Just use, use the best you've got. Okay, so we'll get out of that. And let's pick packet wind link. Click open session and it goes out and connects to the modem, the TNC, in this case, it's a Cantronics on COM port three. Right now you can see I'm set up for a direct connection to VE6 FAR-10. Um, and there are some settings in this case, you see it's a Cantronics modem. There are Kenwood uh, modems built right into various uh, handheld radios here, as you can see, and in the TS2000. Uh, then there's the, uh, these are the SCS Pactor modems, which uh, which can also do uh, um, a packet, yes. Um, here we are uh, we, using these default, uh, I'm pretty much using the default 1200 baud packet modem uh, settings. Um, the, the main thing I adjusted or changed was that I disabled um, or I enabled the ability to adjust the transmit level uh, I happen to have a deviation meter built into a piece of equipment here, so I could adjust it that way. But um, common wisdom, I guess, is <laughs> if you uh, want to uh, uh, get the level right and you don't know how, um, just listen with another radio that uh, can hear both your radio and the destination radio, um, which hopefully is adjusted correctly, and then adjust the transmit level um, until yours sounds pretty much like theirs. I know that's that's pretty uh, uh, flimsy, but that's the way a lot of people do it because they don't have the, the test gear and it's, it's fairly forgiving. Okay, um, the other thing you can do here instead of going direct is you can select a digipeter and you might say, I want to talk to V6, for example, in our area. Well, you know, here's the channel selection dialogue. Let's quickly look, look at that. V6 FAR 10 is there, V6 HM is there, but that's in Edmonton. I don't think we're going to reach Edmonton. Uh, V6 OKT-10 is in Okotoks. Uh, I could select that, uh, but I wouldn't get there. Um, it's down in a hole. So I would select via V6 HRA-8 Digipeter. And that, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is at Alderside. Okay, so that would work, but for uh, speed, I'm just going to pick FAR-10 direct. Okay, and let's let's just try it. Hit start, it connects to the TNC, sends a configuration string, and immediately starts a session. And you can see the message going there and coming back. Uh, and I don't believe there's going to be any traffic there would be a little bit of code there to tell me there was a message coming for me, but no, not in this case. Okay, so that is a simple packet session, 1200 baud. Yeah, it's kind of slow, but it does work and it's, it's pretty reliable. Okay, once you get things set up correctly. Okay, I'm going to exit out of that session and I've, I've created a test email that I'm going to send myself. It's just a whole bunch of quick brown foxes and I'll go ahead and send that. Notice it's to ve6ei at winlink.org. So I'll send that, okay. 
And uh, now what we're going to do is go to a Vera HF WinLink session. Okay. And Vera is uh, the software modem that many, many people are using these days. There is a free version, as I mentioned earlier, and a paid version. The paid version is not terribly expensive um, and uh, provides much greater speeds. It's really quite impressive. So up comes the modem, or this is the WinLink session dialog that controls the modem. And here is the uh, modem itself. Okay, Vera HF. Here you're going to see a bits per second bar graph with every transmission. Over here you see something called the constellation, which uh, if you figure that uh, transmissions are a combination of phase and amplitude, well, you can see the phase and amplitude in this constellation. All right, uh, down at the bottom is a waterfall. There's a volume units display. You want to keep the volume in the uh, green area. <clears throat> it's a little hot right now, but it should work. CPU uh, usage. All right. And let's see. Um, automatic frequency control. Okay. Uh, you want if you want to be pretty much bang on frequency, but anywhere in the green zone, plus or minus a little bit is okay. And signal to noise ratio. Even if your signal is strong, if there's a lot of noise, it may not work. There are settings. Let's quickly tour the settings. Okay, there's TNC set up. It has a what we call local host connection directly to the TNC, meaning it's just right through the computer itself. And here's where the Vera software exists. Okay, All right. and automatically launch Vera when the session is open. Sure. Okay. Uh, radio setup. In this case, it's an ICOM 7200. There's an address, ICOM address. It's going to be USB digital mode. There's a COM port to use for control. All right, all this good stuff. That's a bit of work to get this stuff done, but um, if you buy an ICOM 7300, <laughs> um, it's all there in the user manual um, that, that I mentioned, the, uh, the WinLink training manual that is. Um, or if you buy a 7200 uh, used, it have to be used, you can copy my settings. Okay, then we go over to Vera itself and there are a couple of things here. First is the Vera setup, my CFARS call sign, though I'm not a member anymore, I could delete this, I suppose, and my uh, ham radio call sign, and I've registered this software, so it'll go at maximum speed. One more menu in here, the sound card menu, okay? These are the audio codecs, as they're called for USB audio, um, that um, is automatically installed as soon as I plugged in my... Um, my ICOM 7200 radio. If I had a Signal Link or a, a Tiger, what's the other brand? Uh, anyway, uh, if I plug one of those um, interfaces in, it would install and you would have to pick the uh, appropriate codec. Notice here at the bottom, there's a screen capture. This is right out of an ICOM 7300. And it shows that you should have uh, adjust the drive level here for ALC of about one third. Some people say, oh, that's a little too much. Um, they like to see no ALC action at all. Automatic level transmit audio level control. Um, if you have none at all, um, that guarantees you're not gonna have any distortion of your signal. And it may, the, the, the transmissions may go a little quicker, but up to about one third. This is the guy who wrote the software. So, you know, whatever. Um, this tune button, what you can do is get your radio onto the appropriate band and antenna. And when you make sure the, after you make sure the frequency is not in use, uh, you're gonna go ahead and click the tune button and then look at the uh, ALC meter on your radio and adjust the drive level appropriately. Okay, um, this ALC or drive level is going to change depending on the band and uh, the antenna used. And it may as well vary with, with transmit power if you're running at 50 watts versus 100, for example. Okay, I've got this pretty much set I'm on uh, 80 meters right now, so I'll just close that. And one of the frequencies, or, or rather RMSs, the gateways that I use quite regularly, VA7EDG is in the Arrow Lakes area. He's on a dial frequency of 3591. That's upper sideband, always, always. Uh, 
um, digital modes tend to be on upper sideband, but um, Winlink is always on upper sideband or Vera to be precise. And then what we can do is we can go to channel selection and there's this long list of RMSs and boy, they go and go and go. There's just tons of them, okay? And you get into parts of the world that no way we're gonna reach like Japan and it could be, uh, you know, Germany, anywhere. Okay, there are gateways all over the world. But notice the path reliability and quality numbers. These are based on solar flux index and all the usual things. Okay, you can update this table. I won't do it right now, it takes a minute. Okay, um, but you pick based on what you believe is right because these numbers are not always precise um, for your individual station. And then you would select the one you want, okay? It populates here the call sign and the frequency. The center frequency is always just one and a half kilohertz above the, the dial frequency. It's the center of that three kilohertz wide band, okay? I've got some favorites here, some stations I've had good luck connecting to, a VA7 uh, on Vancouver Island, VE4 PER in, in uh, Manitoba, okay? So, but we'll try VA7EDG. Okay, and hopefully by now that email has arrived at the CMS. So I'll click start. And recall that we do get um, sometimes multiple, the requirement for multiple transmissions because the gateway could be scanning multiple frequencies. But notice, oh, look at that. It's getting in there right away. You can see the constellation showing different phase, four different uh, angles. Ah, and there's the email. It just this window pops up to say, you've got an email. There could be four or 10 in there. And you might say, oh, these three are totally junk. You know, I'm, I've really got to download that one. So you can deselect ones that are not priority, okay? Notice it said 270 bits per second. That's not bad, okay? I'll just download that. And you can watch as it goes. It says FS space Y. Y says you've got one email coming. There's an acknowledged message. It's gonna send it in multiple option uh, transmissions. There's a whole bunch of subcarriers there. I'm gonna turn the volume up. So hopefully you can hear that. The CW uh, identifier. That message went through so fast, I was quite impressed that it almost, uh, I almost didn't have time to let you hear it. Okay, and here it is. Quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. How about that? Okay, so Telnet, fastest, but um, requires internet. Packet, great if you've got a VHF or UHF packet gateway in, in the area, uh, or um, obviously HF, and those are all over the planet. 